<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, members of City Council, please attend the call meeting of the City Council to be held in the sixth floor conference room, 801 Crawford Street, 6 p.m., Monday, January 12, 2015, for the purpose of a public work session. In addition, you may consider a motion to go into closed meeting by order of the mayor. Mr. Cherry? Here. Dr. Edmonds? Here. Mr. Meeks? Here. Mr. Moody? Here. Ms. Simmons? Here. Dr. Whitaker? Here. Mayor Wright? Yes, here. Mr. Rowe? Thank you, Deborah. Ladies and gentlemen, we do have a need to go to closed session. I <clears throat> have a motion before you. Okay. Oh, I move to go into closed meeting pursuant to the provisions of Virginia Code Section 2.23711. For the following purpose, consultation with legal counsel and briefing by staff pertaining to a matter of actual litigation, Funkhauser et al. versus City is permitted under subsection A7. Second. Meeks. Mr. Cherry? Yes. Dr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Meeks? Yes. Mr. Moody? Yes. Ms. Simmons? Yes. Dr. Whitaker? Yes. Mayor Wright? Yes. We are enclosed. Thank you. Are we now using our 250 beds, or will we still have this issue with the sheriff? Because that's costing us money, yes, sir. and we need to address that. Because if we're going to experience a $150,000 increase, we got an agreement that we're going to pay for 250 beds, and we got a sheriff that decides who he wants to send over there and who not. And so we're paying for those beds, and they're not being occupied, correct? That, that's correct. And How many of those are still? Pay every inmate that we have under 250, we pay for twice because we right. guaranteed to pay 250 at the regional jail, and then we're also housing them at the city jail. So right. we're we're double paying every time we don't have that at 250. Now I realize it's a it's a balancing game, and there'll be months when it's 240, <coughs> uh, months when it's a little over 250. That's but we've been down in the 230 below the 230 range, and that really means we're, we're double paying for some inmates, and we need to get that squared away. I'm, I mean, I'm getting, I've been, been notified by other cities how crazy it is that we're not taking advantage of, of, of the opportunity there, and, and we need to broach that subject with the sheriff. I mean, we should max out those beds at the regional jail. So if he's sitting over here with 400 or 300 prisoners, Absolutely. it needs to be maxed out over there because we're already paying for it. And, and anything less than maxing that out, we need to know why. I mean, that's probably a separate issue from this, but it's costing us twice right. the amount. Well, the sheriff's uh, contention is that our per diem cost at the jail is cheaper than what the regional cost is. That's, that's well, been the contention. In, in some respects, he's right because he, yes. he gets to move the most medically needy inmates to the regional jail. Yeah. And the that's DOC, has a way of, DOC has a way of, of equalizing uh, across all jail facilities, whether they're regional jails or city jails. DOC has a standard um, worksheet that they require to be completed every year, and it tells you what the cost per day to house inmates in every every jail facility across the state. So it takes all that into consideration. There's a real way to know, and we have to report that every year, what our real costs are at the regional jail, what our real costs are at the city jail. But we're still paying for 250 and we only have no 230 what. No matter what, right. we're writing a check for 250 And that's a very good point. And, of course, the sheriff doesn't work for the city manager and he doesn't work for council. And so they're... When you see the sheriff, you might want to put a bug in his ear. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Heal him, please. Yes, sir. A, a few months ago, um, we were talking about some other um, homeless services. Uh, I mentioned to you that um, uh, the Healing Place of Hampton Roads had begun a discussion with the, the regional jail about the possibility of siting um, their, what they want to plan as a, a campus or, or a, uh, a facility for their um, male clients uh, on the regional jail site. Um, just to recap for a second, the Healing Place of Hampton Roads is a regional residential substance abuse uh, um, and drug treatment facility uh, for homeless persons. And their plan, uh, the, the Healing Place of Hampton Roads would like to plan for a 200-bed male facility, facility in Hampton Roads and uh, a female facility, facility at, at another location. <coughs> and, and so 
the regional jail began to work with the healing place in, uh, in con considering all the contingencies involved in citing that on the regional jail campus. Um, the regional jail authority appointed a subcommittee uh, to look at um, uh, possible sites within the campus and it came back and said um, if, if this is going to move forward the regional jail would rather lease in terms of a long-term lease than to give land or to sell land to the to the um, uh, healing place of Hampton Roads but um, before it would move any further it wanted to have the consent from the city of Portsmouth as a host city as to whether this is a good idea to, to site in, in Portsmouth. And is so, everybody oriented on the map? Okay. This is Victory Boulevard up here. That's the regional jail. And that yellow was the footprint that they were talking about for the healing place. And that fourth quad over there where we want to put our jail, if we tear this one downtown, is in the upper right, right? Okay. Right. This is not finished to two stories. It would finish that to two stories and put the fourth quadrant there. That's what we looked at a couple of years ago. Okay. Um, considerations, as you can imagine, for uh, locating such a facility <laughs> in Portsmouth would be, you know, what are the neighborhood, neighborhood impacts um, uh, for having a, a drug treatment facility for homeless persons? Um, what are the operational savings to law enforcement and to, and to the judicial system? Um, Portsmouth would obviously realize some benefit from being able to take uh, arrested persons directly to that facility rather than uh, housing them in the jail and running them through the judicial system. Um, the cost of providing a social service network for these uh, persons uh, during the day because they don't stay in the facility all day long. And of course, um, access to employment um, because the idea is to get them detoxed and, uh, and, and self-sufficient. So um, the police department, we asked the police department to do an analysis of, of, uh, of the impact of one of these facilities. And uh, Captain Garrett Shelton, if you would come forward, um, um, he prepared the, um, the, the memo that was at the back of your read ahead. Um, and um, uh, and did the analysis and the recommendation. And so um, if you would, just take a few minutes to talk about your methodology and the findings and the conclusion from that study. Brandon, well, be before he starts it, what is our contribution to this whole healing place piece regionally, and what are the other localities' contributions? Um, there is uh, a formula that the, that the regional task force to end homelessness came up with for all the cities in Hampton Roads, and that's both on the peninsula and South Hampton Roads, and the, the counties, and this, this catchment area included um, the Eastern Shore. And that formula was based on um, poverty and fiscal capacity, and we all agree to the formula. Uh, Portsmouth's uh, percent share of that was going to be 5.83%. So we were going to pay going forward if we were going to do this thing we were going to pay 5.83 percent of the capital cost and that percent of the ongoing operating cost we haven't paid them a penny no i understand We've I'm given them some but that wouldn't money. matter whether it was in portsmouth or newport news or york county that's right right that's right and so with this being the host city and it's here but even though it's regional jail site are we getting any benefits from that on our well share Let's talk about the impact that uh, it may have on the neighborhood, and that's why we asked uh, the police department to go look at uh, places where there was this type of facility. And to kind of quickly get to the punchline, we recommend that we not be the host city on this. And Captain Shelton is going to tell you why. Gary. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the council, uh, Chief Hargis came to me and asked me to look into this from a uh, police perspective and community perspective and how it relates to services that the department may be involved in, how it impacts the community. Um, the way I approached it was um, much like writing a thesis. Um, my thesis statement was that I feel that this would be a good program for the city of Portsmouth and that it would benefit the citizens and the police department and be of little or no cost to the very low cost of the city. 
So I went in with that to prove that that was the case. Um, I paid three visits, one to Richmond unannounced, uh, not actually to the healing place, but to the surrounding area. And the reason for the unannounced visit was for no uh, possible interference by anyone involved in the program. Uh, not even our director locally was aware that I was doing this. So I took a uh, couple of officers with me. We went, and you, I think you've read the report, not to get into the uh, lengthy detail of it, but it was clear to us that the impact to the community around this particular healing place in Richmond, totally separate and totally different entity than the one in Wake County or Raleigh, but this one um, had a significant impact on the surrounding area. Uh, you can see it from the razor wire on the businesses, talking to the business owners, the people that were sleeping and leaving trash and stealing and things like that, just from the businesses in this, res in this industrial area. Um, the one in Richmond was in an industrial one. area much like ours? Because this Elmhurst clear. Lane is pretty industrialized. But I would say on a pendulum, but the pendulum was swinging. Richmond was completely industrial. Mm -hmm. uh, White County would be the country club. Mm -hmm. On a 300-acre former psychiatric facility, it was rolling green hills. On the pendulum, we're swinging to the Richmond. industrial side of the midway point, but not all the way right. to that. Okay. Um, but in Richmond, there, I mean, you can see from a lot of the pictures, the trash, the discussion with people, uh, the members that were actually going there, the folks that were inside, one of them asked me specifically how close it was to the residential area. And when I explained it to them, uh, excluding the uh, colorful language, it was a resounding no, uh, not that close. So not to be dissuaded, went to Wake County unannounced, Again, similar as I did in Richmond, and was <coughs> very impressed with a lot of things. And we're talking about Raleigh and Richmond, two capital cities, one North Carolina, Virginia. And so a lot of similarities, a lot of panhandling in Richmond, a lot of corners and people on it. And you knew they were from the healing place simply by what they were wearing and the backpacks they were carrying, and it was confirmed by the local police department. In Raleigh, we saw none of it, zero. We couldn't have found a homeless person if it was our only way out. Uh, very well maintained in the downtown area. The facility was well maintained. Uh, it was If I'd gone there first and not gone to Richmond, much different outlook here. But when we paid the visit formally to the healing place in Raleigh, um, I explained to him what we had done and... Um, <coughs> Some interesting conversation about the two different facilities, but I was overly impressed with how well Raleigh's facility, when it came to the addicted <coughs> folks and how they handled them, how that worked. From their uh, non-medical uh, detox when they take them in, uh, all the way into the different steps of the program, and it, it was a very impressive visit. My, my concern in the end of this is that we, as the mayor mentioned, I think we swing much closer on the pendulum to the industrial side as far as a physical location. Where I think we swing even further to that side is Raleigh had funding from two very large independent donors who were sports team owners in that area. Plus they have, it's a, you know, they're both, they're, the whole healing place is a 501c3 uh, organization and while there's a lot of benefits to uh, the reduction of costs from medical expenses of a lot of our homeless folks that constantly go into the hospitals, go to the jails, go to the courts, time with the police department, we don't have in place a lot of the infrastructure that uh, Raleigh had. For example, their uh, fire and paramedical personnel are especially trained to deal with these addicted people on the street crisis management way above the levels that we've even thought about doing in this city. Um, they have in place already uh, transitional housing with folks to be able to move them because you don't graduate from the healing place and then go right out on your own. There's a transitional part that has to work there. The other big thing is of the 200 people about and, and 
currently in Richmond and Raleigh, about half to 75% of them have to leave at 6.30 in the morning. The ones that don't have to leave are the ones that have risen to a certain tier within the healing place. Well, if you think about it here, everybody's going to start tier one. There are no, well, we're going to pick this group to be at this level so you stay the whole time. So in essence, 200 people at 6.30 in the morning will leave that facility. Where do they go? Um, if it's what I saw in Richmond, it's going to be the Victory Boulevard corridor and the Airline Boulevard corridor. Uh, I, I do think from the police department standpoint, we're going to see significant impact calls for service initially uh, until things get um, controlled as far as um, the contracts with the healing place and the individual and how, and how that works real quickly is everyone at this table could go into the healing place on day one. All of you but two could decide you've had enough, you want out. So those two start to go through, well, the next day you all decide to come back. They'll let you come back. But then only one stays and the rest of you are out. And this process will continue to happen as long as they are willing to sign the contract, the individuals who come in, and as long as they're still here. Um, the, two, the two striking things in Raleigh that, well, uh, actually three that really set me back were the claim is that it's only for the areas that, that are involved in the particular healing place. For Wake County Raleigh, they claim it's for Wake County Raleigh residents. And during my stay there, every person I went to ask where they were from, one person was from the state of North Carolina. And I asked 20 people. 19 of them were from out of state. Out of and state? They, out of state. And they had learned of the facility through family members that had come to the facility. I asked them, there were 650 people who had silver chipped or graduated the program. I asked them since their doors had been open, how many had come through in one capacity or the other, and the number was approximately 10,000. So 9,650, I asked them where they ended up, and the answer was back out in the community. Um, and that could be it anywhere. And then the last thing was when I spoke to Dennis Parnell, who was the director of the Wake County Raleigh program, um, my concern, and, and I relate what the chief was expressing, was that we would end up as a dumping ground for the area. And he said, if I were in your shoes, I would agree with you that here it's unique in the way we're funding and how large we are. In Hampton Roads, the best way to do that would be, as he referred to as a mothership. You build a crisis facility in each one of the localities, and that's where you take your initial crisis people. And then you build one facility that once they get out of crisis, they come to the facility. And clearly, I don't think that's the possibility here. So that that's a long way to get to, um, I think, from our perspective, from the community, I think it would be... Um, timing would be the issue. Well, I think the program was exceptional in Raleigh. I just don't think we're equipped yet uh, with the infrastructure to handle. Uh, Captain, I appreciate that, your comments there. I was more interested when I read this piece about how we came to the conclusion that this was a good site. I mean, of all of our regional partners with Suffolk and Virginia Beach and Chesapeake with all of this available land, how on earth could a collective body come and say, yeah, there's there's the perfect spot in Hampton Roads, right here in Portsmouth. I think the answer lies with the executive director of the Healing Place. This is this is their first shot. They're they're not going to give up, and I would encourage them to keep trying because I think it is a model that works. Where, where does the this? executive director live? <laughs> well, wait a minute. Uh, that's a very good question. We didn't serve it up as the best light at all. And we've given it a good, good, thorough um, examination and multiple visits to places where it is. And the bottom line is, is that this is not the time for Portsmouth to be the host. Uh, you got a great big neighborhood here. You got a great big commercial center there. You got an industrial center over there. The timing's not good. Yeah. 
No, and, I, and I mean, I agree. I mean, I'm like you, Brandon. I'm a huge proponent of that because I think that it, that model is great. I just think, you know, it should probably be somewhere that that area we're investing a whole lot in bringing back the whole industrial yes, piece there along the Victory Boulevard corridor as well as the Cavalier Manor neighborhood and over on the Park Manor side. And so, Let's stop doing it. Yes. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Manager, may, let me make sure I'm clear. Um, this recommendation for um, this facility and location that was made by the regional um, task force. The regional what, sir? You mentioned, or it was mentioned in the presentation, the regional task force. Uh, it was a specific name that was given. Right. What was what was that organization's name? You want to elaborate on that, right? It's the uh, the regional task force to end homelessness. Right. So it's, it's made up of. Uh, representatives, um, their staff people. Right. From. So, is this recommendation um, for this location? Is that coming from this region, or was this a request from uh, the Healing Place of Hampton Roads? At the time, the he the Healing Place of Hampton Roads was still in its formation stages. It was mostly supported by the regional task force, and when they came up with this idea. I can't remember if it was the healing place of Hampton Roads that said, let's try the regional jail or the regional task force, but they're, they're pretty much the same group of people that meet regularly to, to try to address the homeless issues but, from a regional perspective. But it's a major issue, you know, poverty and homelessness, and are we expected to get another recommendation of a place if this isn't uh, what Portsmouth sure. is desiring, and if so, when is that recommendation coming? I don't know, and, and we, you all are getting the first blush at our recommendation that we don't pursue this any further. Again, the regional jail said we will give Portsmouth essentially the first right of refusal, and if you have an objection to it as a host city, we won't pursue this on our campus any further. And so now... I'm telling you this, that's the, that's the recommendation of our staff, and if you agree with that, I'll tell the jail authority that that's our recommendation, our recommendation that we don't want that to con be considered further, and I'll also tell the healing place of Hampton Roads, so they'll have to start looking for another site. The, the persons who are uh, uh, brought to this facility, how, how are they initially um, brought into this facility? Is it through an arrest uh, by the police or, or what? Yes, sir. Okay. Garrett, you want to answer that? I, I think I can elaborate a little further on that. Um, the way this facility is set up, it's a, it's a multi-tiered system, and the first tier in is a uh, non-medical detox center. Uh, they don't take anyone who's not currently addicted or either drugs or alcohol and in crisis. So that's what's coming in. And they go into the initial detoxification facility, which is on campus, and they're there for as many as five days. And in that time, what they're doing is they're using some of the members who've been there longer to come in and talk to them and then try to bring them over into what they call OTS-1, which is Off the Streets 1. That's their first level. And that gets them a bed in the facility, which is separate than the few beds they have in the detox. So, and they can come in either voluntarily um, arrest is, a, I think, a, a, an overbroad uh, umbrella that is used sometimes where we would normally arrest someone for drunk in public. And drunk in public is an offense that we, we arrest people for, but not because it's an arrestable offense. It's because it's a, they're a danger to be on the street. So we take them into custody and they're held for a period of time until they're able to be released. What this does is, instead of us physically taking them to a magistrate and to jail, we can take them here to the detox center. So they're not truly under arrest. They're in our custody. And if they want to go there, and I understand through the other healing places that that's generally the option versus going to jail, uh, that they will go there. Um, the other big part of this, I mentioned the fire department and paramedics and the training they have, they actually go out to our homeless populations and they work with them on the street to get them into the program. They they try to get them off the street and in the program before we're ever involved in it, before the police ever get caught. And 
you know, anecdotally, they followed one gentleman who cost them the most money in the uh, emergency room in jail for a period of five years to see what happened to his expenses. And then ultimately, at the end of the five years, he was not only not costing them money, he was a taxpaying citizen, and then they were getting money. So that's one of the anecdotal stories they put out there. But you're talking about a five-year process of him in, out, in, out, in, out. Um, so that's, that's how you get in there. You have to be in crisis. You have to be addicted on, al- on alcohol or drugs. And you either have to volunteer or you have to be volunteered with a little coaxing from the police department. So the, the homeless, so the homelessness aspect of it enters when? It's not purely someone making a determination that this person is is homeless. That's a non-arrest situation. Uh, Actually, you not only have to be homeless, you have to be addicted on drugs or alcohol and homeless to be Okay, and so so this facility uh, has no behavioral health uh, treatment involved. It's just purely detailed. They do. They have a professional staff. It's a small footprint that's on scene, and they're clinical social workers, psychologists, and there are staff members there that do um, work with them. It's also largely a peer-based program. It is the, the peer work to maintain the rules and stay within the guidelines, and there's meetings, there's counseling sessions, there's, there's a lot of, from the standpoint of working with addicted uh, people, I have found in 28 years of law enforcement this to be one of the best programs I've seen. Hands down, what I saw when I was there was one of the best I've seen. But the infrastructure that they have in place to deal with all the aspects from the mental health aspect to the medical side of it, to the getting them into the facility, to the transitional, feeding them, when they, when they, both places, when you go out at 6.30 in the morning, you have lunch off campus. The closest place we have currently is the Oasis. That's it's a, not, and they walk. Here, let me interject. Uh, it's not that it's not a good program. In fact, that's why we let the jail look at this. Um, it's just not the right time and the right place for this program to start here in Portsmouth. And the concept of a mothership is a good concept. Remember the footprint that uh, Brandon talked about. It's just not Portsmouth and Chesapeake. It's the whole Hampton Roads to include the peninsula. Well, we, we have a significant homeless population. Um, when you say it's not the right time, when is it the right time? Well, let me tell you. I have firsthand experience. I have probably <coughs> three years. I know I have three years as the president of the Portsmouth Volunteers for the Homeless Board and a decade on the board. And we probably have the most compassionate uh, program for homelessness. And we, PVH, has put more uh, people who were homeless into both transitional and permanent housing than any other iliomocenary agency in Portsmouth. It's got a very good track record. We work in conjunction, we, the city, with PVH and Oasis and the Park Center um, daily. That's one of the functions of uh, Brandon. Um, We have um, taken it very, very serious. When we have cold weather, for example, for the people who don't have a place to go, we make sure that we have places. The same is true in, in the summertime. This city has, on its own, opened emergency shelters in public facilities to, to get people out of the heat. The heat can kill you just as fast as uh, the coal. So it's, we're working hard, we, Portsmouth, we, the region, to end homelessness. This is a good idea, but this does not appear to be the best location for this facility. That, that's why I was. Uh, is it that is not the right time, or is it that is not the right location? Right location. You know, because I'm, I'm the right time. I mean, I don't know what what you mean by that. Okay, but, it's not yeah. that it's not the right location for a startup um, facility like this. Okay, so are we going to investigate other possible locations okay. to address that? And those locations may not be in Portsmouth. They could be someplace else. 
hopefully they won't be. Well, uh, I hope that's not the attitude we bring to the homeless is because... Um, well, Brandon know, we said that the, the, the entry into this is just not homelessness. It, it's uh, homelessness uh, and people who have uh, substance abuse. Is that correct? Yes, this is Brandon. It's a tree. So place. it's not a homeless shelter. But I think the very fact that we said, let's explore it, tells you that we have an open mind. I mean, it would have been very easy for us to say no. Portsmouth's been uh, the host city for uh, enough of these things. So we, we, we gave at the office. Well, are we going to. Somebody else's turn. Yeah. Uh, are we going to get some type of. Uh, Serious recommendation coming to us as far as addressing uh, the issue that was presented from the healing place, uh, because they or, or from the regional. Well, it's working yeah. in conjunction. Yeah. Um, Brandon said his recollection was fuzzy as to which one was it the healing place or the task force. My recollection was is that. This site was being championed first by the Healing Place leadership, and then it morphed into the task force. But nonetheless, whether it's A or B, they're working together, and they will be reporting back not only to Portsmouth, but to all the localities that they're looking for money from as to exactly what they think is the best location to then reevaluate. Okay. Well, who's our regional what? rep? I'm sorry. Who's our regional rep on this? It's me. Okay. It started out being Bill Park when he okay. was the director of behavioral health care services and then that transition I just Okay. What's Grace, Gracie would be um, <laughs> I'm sure she she wouldn't mind me taking the, over. The the, <laughs> the, 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 for, the formula for being the host city would be five point eight percent of the capital and operating expenses. What what's the non-host cities percentage, and what does that percentage equate to in, in real dollars? Just a ballpark. It's the balance of the hundred percent. I mean, I can provide you the spreadsheet of how that breaks down by jurisdiction. And we will. But we don't know the. We don't have any no. soft this, numbers. This is such a infant organization. This whole concept. I mean, I. I the mayor and I went to a mayor's south side of the Hampton Roads, and we heard, we heard this presentation about a year and a half ago. And it was ambitious then, and it's ambitious now. They've, they're getting more mature, but they've got, they've got to grow some more legs. Okay. Yes, sir. I think this is a great idea, and we can't hide our faces from it. But I, I can see the uh, relevance of the right location. That means a lot. Uh, not only to the people that would come there, but for an opportunity for them to feel like they belong in an area without being pushed away. And uh, we cannot deny that, that we need something like this, whether it's in Portsmouth or another city. Uh, but I think Portsmouth needs to be involved with it some way or another. Mm -hmm. I think they recognize the, the track record, Bishop, that we have here. I mean, we've done, as, as the manager said, so well that other cities are sending homeless brothers and sisters over to Portsmouth because we take that's such problem. good care, and that is somewhat of a problem. They even put them in benefit. taxi cabs uh, uh, to come here, and I mean, I've visited... Uh, the night shelters and, and actually queried some of the people and they were from Norfolk and other places and I was asking how did you get over here and so I mean we do do a lot and I think the last four years we may have started with about 100 to 120 people persons at night doing our winter shelter programs and I think last year we yeah. got down to about 50 yes, sir. Yeah, below that. and what are we now this year down to the 30 so we're making significant progress in, in our efforts to, to do this so I'm, I, I agree I think we're all saying we're supportive but I think the location with the redevelopment of Victory as well as the neighborhoods and the community college right up the street I think that would be a hard sell to citizens to yeah, Doc. And there, I'd like to also add that the faith community is a lot involved in this type of oh, right. transition. Uh, well, because of the faith cold, community right? and working with PVH, that's how we've been able to, exactly. to help these folks for all these years. I mean, I'm real proud of what we're doing. We, we said we've tried to stamp it out in 10 years, and we're in year six, maybe, or something like that. But 
Is it six brand? And so, I mean, we're making strides. I don't know where the other cities are. I know the mayor over there made it one of his focal points at his state of the city last year about addressing it, but I don't know how much they do other than talk about it. But we're actually doing a lot, and a lot of churches and other organizations working to kind of help that. So, uh, and I think they recognize that. It might have been one of, our, one of the reasons they wanted to come here Probably first. So. But anyway. <laughs> so where we're with this. Are we collectively uh, in agreement that this is the wrong location? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds better than not. But, rather but, but than you know, we, 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 like what as we say, we, we can't have an issue. The, the, the poor and the homeless are all going to be among us, and, right. and we and we got to. It's our responsibility to, to be generous to us. To them, right. So we got to whatever they come back with. We need to be worthy to, to, to participate in whatever our share is. We, we don't have to do it. Yeah. Well, we need to know what the cost is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we don't have to do it. Okay. Thank y'all very much. Thank you, Captain. Thank yes, you, Brian. Okay. okay. The next is a budget discussion and presentation. This is relates to the development of the 2015-2016 budget, which will uh, be introduced uh, at the end of March. And as I said in my memorandum to you, we want to take the opportunity to brief you at the work sessions from here to the uh, my presentation of the proposed budget to you so that you're uh, very much informed and part of the process. Uh, telling us to turn left here, go right, go straight, stay between the, the ditches. Um, this is, um, we hardly ever stop working on the budget. As soon as we get one adopted, uh, we start working on the other. Uh, and we start soliciting uh, the budget uh, request uh, six months before the start of the, the fiscal year. And why don't we go to the next uh, slide uh, and the next one. Uh, we want to talk about what drives the budget and on the revenue side uh, how that looks. And in a word, it looks flat. Uh, we want to talk to you tonight about the things that we know are the expenditures if we did nothing else. If we added no new service, these are the expenditures that we're facing. And then the projected shortfalls. So you have an order of magnitude. We're not asking you to make any decision tonight. It's too early because we still have a ways to go. The General Assembly starts this week. And as you know, uh, between the last session of the General Assembly and this session of the Civil General Assembly, the state has reinstituted the policy of take your checkbook out, local government, write a check, and give that money back to the state. So we need to know what what lies ahead for the state before we can finalize the budget. Carol, you want to cover those? Yes, yeah, so we, we are um, continuing to fine tune the revenue estimates, but right now it looks as though our revenues are essentially going to be flat. And um, and worst case is that we could see a, a decline in revenues. And obviously... Um, How do you we'll, make that determination? Well, we, we look at all the revenue sources, particularly the major ones, and we obviously, um, Jane real and her estate. staff are in the process of updating the, the real estate assessment now, and once we have a better sense of how that's looking, that, that will drive one of our, our most significant revenue sources. Then we, we look at general overall economic trends and what the trends are year to date. So I, I look at how much have we collected of a particular revenue now um, <coughs> compared to where we were in prior years so that we can get some sense of where we're likely to end up the year. Just like a Walmart will do, same store comparison year to year, and you know, how was March against March last year. We do the same thing. Yeah. How we uh, the purpose of my question is, it's, is, you know, we've got a lot of things coming online over the next year and next couple of years that will be beneficial to us from a revenue perspective and to make the statement flat. I was just curious as to do you know something that's going to dip that caused our net effect to be zero because, again, we've got some opportunities here in the next year. Yeah, because I would say that, that, that factor in, you know, Janie's assessments and 
we don't want to overestimate revenues at this particular point. I understand. Okay. But that, that's the base of your presentation. So if you show me a shortfall and you're saying flat and we don't really know that, then it would. But anyway, go ahead with it and then we'll make the uh, comments out. This, this way to get come out and look at like Heroes Mayor. Yeah, when it, when I, it, when I know, right. Back we we win it. We all get a white horse and ride off. I got it. I need a big horse. I need a Clydesdale, but uh, y'all might can use a smaller one. But anyway, go ahead. Overly conservative and likewise try not to be overly aggressive. We want we want to come up with reasonable numbers so that we aren't, um, you know, we, we aren't causing actions that don't need to occur. And last year we, we had it um, estimated just about right on. And we continue to, I mean, I, I look at the revenue constantly and we'll be continuing to fine tune it as we move through the process. Um, obviously right now we're six months into the fiscal year. We, we have some fairly good numbers, but there are some revenue sources um, including the the um, business license tax that we don't and the bank franchise tax that don't come in until later on in the year and personal property, um, we will have a better idea once we see what that um, assessed value looks like as to where where trends are moving. Um, and on personal property, you may recall last year too, we we lost some significant machinery and tool tax because we lost um, Gwaltney, which was one of our our major. Um, Payers of that tax, so that that affected us. And they hit us on two two fronts. We lost them on the tax side, but we also lost them as a water customer. Uh, Brian, how were they as a water customer? <clears throat> they were one of our largest. It was about a half million dollars of revenue a, a year. Okay. Um, and again, based on our preliminary estimates, and um, Janie is always very good about working closely with us to. Um, to fine tune the the estimate of where we're where the the assessed valuation is looking, but right now we're estimating that a penny will generate six hundred ninety thousand for next year. That's a little bump up because it was down about six seventy. What? Yeah, and there was some supplemental um, additions to to the real estate roles that that also helped boost up that um, assessed valuation. Um, you may recall that the, the current budget, 2015, is balanced with $16.7 million of fund balance. Um, of this, about $7.8 million is assumed to be ongoing in nature, and the, the vast majority of that is the $6.4 million that was appropriated from fund balance for the schools. We, um, for purposes of this presentation, we've assumed that that $6.4 million is going to be an ongoing um, require contribution to the to the school system. On the expenditure side, we're starting with a baseline of um, of our original adopted budget for this year. Now we're in the process of loading up the and reviewing the um, the current payroll. We take a snapshot of our of our payroll in January, and that becomes our starting point. So if we've had um, if we've had turnover and we have starting salaries for um, replacement folks who are at a lower starting point, that may save us some money, but we'll, you know, we'll be working on that um, over the next couple of weeks. Um, we, we also know that we're going to have, and we'll go over that in a, in a um, subsequent slide, we have known cost increases. One of the more significant ones is, as John mentioned, the reversion of state aid, which um, will cost us $600,000 that obviously was not anticipated with the um, 2015 budget. <coughs> do, 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 do they, we, we're going to, how does that work? Write a check back to them or they just yeah. hope they would yes, hold their money? No, we're writing a check. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and we, we want to pay per trail. And we, we just had to write a check for the 2015 fiscal year. Um, but it's worth noting that we the state. To let them come in. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's right. a good question. Right. We yeah. debated this, and we just said no. Uh, right it's check. more yeah. symbolic to, for us to write the check back to the state. That's right. And it's easier to track too in our um, in, in our history. I was curious. <laughs> but just for um, for background, in in the prior years when the state was doing this reversion, the amount statewide was about sixty million dollars. They are only proposing. 30 million for 15 and for 16. So, um, if, it, if that changes, in the past our, our cost would be about 1.2 million. Right now it's 600,000, and we're, we're hoping that it doesn't increase from that point. So, these are some of the expenditure drivers that um, we're facing as we as we begin developing the budget. 
the um, as you may recall, we had a plan. We knew that we we had increases in debt service that were going to occur between um, the, the 2015 fiscal year and 2021, and then they would decline. So we used some fund balance and assumed that we would still continue to to put a half a million of ongoing money into the general fund every year to pay for that cost until it declines after 2021. So that half a million we know will need to, to go in as planned. Um, HRT is increasing by, and we're, we're estimating about 400,000. We, we haven't gotten final numbers from them, but just based on service increases. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the state rate aid reversion is um, 600,000. We, we are still sorting through the health insurance costs to see what the net um, impact will be, so that's, that's an unknown. Um, the, and Brandon touched on earlier the increased jail per diems. Last year, we, we scrubbed the budget over the past couple of years very hard to, to try to squeeze out all expenditures that, um, that we could. One of the areas that we, we uh, made an adjustment to was social, the local cost for social services. In the past, the, um, the city had historically budgeted quite a bit more than, than what we actually ended up using. We adjusted it down based on prior year's actuals, um, but based on activity last year and so far this year, it looks like we are probably going to have to bump that up, but we will continue to work with the social services staff to, to fine tune that and get it to you know as low as we possibly can. Um, the schools, I, I mentioned that um, we, we're assuming the 6.4 million in one time money that was appropriated would, will continue. Obviously, we've not received their request for fiscal year 16. Um, we, we also mentioned the, the city's contribution to OPEB that after tackling the pension issue, that OPEB was our next major financial um, challenge. And, and in fact, you know, we had a, a, a total liability that was almost as high as the pension. We've already- uh, 160 million? No, sir. Two, 200, over $200 million. Over oh, 200 million. Oh, but, 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 but aren't we addressing that with some yes, of the change fact, that what we're making right now? So Absolutely. Uh, remember we, what we did, uh, we're moving our post-65 retirees off of the right. city's health plan and on to Medicare Part A and Part B with the choice of the supplemental insurance. The supplemental insurance comes uh, much like Medigap. And uh, insurance carrier has plans A through F, with the F being the Cadillac. The punchline is, is that even if they did this on their own, they would save money. They could save as much as $150 a month for a married couple that's retired post-65. Uh, Part B, Medicare is $104. Uh, depending on the individual, it could be anywhere from 140 to 164 uh, Plan F under Medigap supplemental. Do, so, so do we have, a, have any idea how doing that affects the 200 million? What, what? It, um, well, we, we did that in conjunction with some other changes. Yeah. Okay. We, we separately rated our three groups of um, health insurance uh, users, the active employees, the retirees under 65, and the retirees over 65. We changed the, the minimum service requirement to be eligible for OPEB. And those three things combined, and we can um, refresh the, the exact number, but it was a significant decline in our liability. And what we want to do is get an updated, the, I had an estimate that was done by an actuary in November of 2013. I want to have that estimate updated given all the changes we made and the timing of those, and then we can report to you what, what that net impact is. But we, we know that right now we're only funding our our liability and our ARC on a pay-as-you-go basis. We're essentially just paying the cost of um, our subsidy of the of the premiums, and we need to we need to get our contribution up to a level where we're actually paying the actuarially um, determined cost. Now, you guys have done a lot of heavy lifting. Remember, what, three years ago, the rating agency said you got to fix your pension plan because we're concerned that it's going to the whole thing's going to slide into the river and you'll you'll be bankrupt. Uh, we did that. 
And we said, we'll address that first, and then we're going to address OPEB. And we're addressing OPEB with what we're doing with retirees and what we're doing with new hires. Uh, no longer can you come to work for, for the city one day, retire the next, and be eligible for our health insurance. You have to have tenure in order to get that. Um, with the pre-65, it's amazing the number of pre-65 uh, retirees that you talk to that, um, and I'll use this example, we had a fire captain, young guy, what, 43 back? Went fr Retired on a Friday, let's say, went to work w on Monday uh, <coughs> with another uh, agency. And we addressed that, too, by allowing our, our retirees that are coming out of the Portsmouth uh, Fire and Police to come back to, to work for us. So you've done a real good job in, in, in addressing this. What we want to try well, like to Like Paige do, said, when are we going to find out how much we save it? <laughs> how much? I mean, I know it's going to take a little while, but, I mean, we got a $200,000, $200, million bogey. How much of that is this policy affected? Do you remember the number off the top of your head? I, 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 I think it brought it down to either buy $60 million or $260 million, but we can, we'll send that out. And that's my, that. I'm thinking it brought it down to 64, but I'm like Carol. I'm not sure if we reduced it. By sixty, or brought it down to sixty. Okay, all right. But we can we can get that to you. But it's the actual that data was based on the last valuation was done in twenty twelve, and the actuary just updated it. I think it'd be good for us to have a fresh, um, you know, fresh review based on our most recent valuation, okay. and we, we can ask them to do that. But we'll uh, we'll share the. That's the a very good question. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And finally, other operating cost increases. We, um, we're in the process now of going through the, the budget requests that departments have submitted. In some cases, for instance, the sheriff has contracts with um, his jail operations that have automatic cost of living adjustments in them. So some of those will need to build in, but we are continuing to look at and, and look critically at what actual spending was in prior years versus what uh, department's budget and budget request is. Yeah, I think it would be good if you if you make sure that you know when we get the package that talked to uh, how we were treating the treating the uh, retirees the post sixty five and with you know the health savings plan and all that stuff. You probably need to give that to uh, Dr. Whitaker because. That's a very good because idea. Because we all got a bunch of a, a lot of questions about that and, 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 and that, that document answered. A lot, of, a, lot, a lot of questions. So he's going to start getting those same questions now, probably. We'll send so. you that. Uh, we actually start the um, briefings on Wednesday. They'll run Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, where <coughs> one exchange will be here. And, and again, I think we're being very, very um, generous in the health savings plan. We're given uh, $1,400. And the way it's set up is that you can use it to pay your premium on your Medigap. You change it to what? Oh, God, I, thought you said yes, I thought it was 14. 1400 Because as soon as you start a briefing again, the question is going to start again. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I know that. <laughs> and it, and we've, been try, we've been very liberal because <coughs> we know this, this is change. And uh, human nature is that you're change adverse. And so we have done such things as that this health savings is not a use or lose. At the end of the year, if you, if you haven't used the 1400 it goes over to the next year. And if it happens, hasn't been used then, it goes over to the next year. Uh, so it's what we're trying to do is make sure that first, the service is high touch, and second, that no one is scared or fearful by, by the change. So when we add up all of those um, expected shortfalls uh, the, 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 from a rough cut basis, our, our total shortfall before any other increases is over $10 million, which is equivalent to $0.15 cents on the tax rate. So we, we have a lot of work to do. I'm, I'm, glad, yeah. Bill, I'm glad Bill left. <laughs> Did he faint? Yeah. No, no, he had yeah, I think he's under the table. <laughs> and so as we sharpen the pencil, yeah. uh, the next briefing we're going to come back is the revenue forecast for the next uh, five-year period so that you get a, a feel for not what does it look next year. And, and this is the important thing, and you know this. 
when you adopt a budget, you're looking five years out. You're building the future. Okay. Okay. Doctor, what? Um, so if I'm if I'm reading this correctly, are you saying that we are facing presently a ten million? dollar shortfall? Yes, sir. Based on what we know now, if you add up all of those um, items that we enumerated previously, that's, um, that's what, what we're, the magnitude of what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And again, we will be scrubbing through the budget. Um, the, the, the payroll information will be, be very helpful if, if we find that our baseline is lower than, um, than what it is this year. But just order of magnitude, we, we have a, a pretty significant shortfall that we're going to have to close. And we're not going to be able to close a shortfall of that magnitude simply by scrubbing through the budgets. We're going we're gonna to have to make some choices about what we can fund and whether, um, whether there's a willingness or an appetite to raise any revenue. Well, I'm, I'm confused because you look at all of the development that's going on around the city, mid-city um, apartments, uh, how is it that, and, and I'm going back to your first chart, um, that at best you said you were expecting flat revenues, which I don't know, if, if your definition of flat revenues is we're going to stay at the same level of revenues as the previous year, is that what you're calling for? Yes, revenue? but um, keep in mind that it's not just de development is not our only revenue source. We also get revenue from the state. Um, and let the, me give you an example of that. Uh, we got word today that the uh, the budget is going to cut uh, a quarter of a million dollars out of money that was flowing to the to Portsmouth to the Sports Hall of Fame, and the session hasn't even started yet. So. Um, just like if I poured this water into the Elizabeth River, it's not going to do much to raise the level. It's exciting to get, and that's why we've got a very aggressive economic development uh, campaign. It's exciting to get a Kroger marketplace, but it doesn't raise all the votes uh, as much as you would like for it to do. <coughs> Jamie has to go through and do a citywide uh, assessment, and we've got neighborhoods that come up, but we also have neighborhoods that go down, and gives you a net effect that sometimes is pretty scary. And she'll come back to council and give you uh, the results. They're quite good at, at, at what they do, uh, and they pretty much are on the target as far as assessments versus what the sales price is. It's called the assessment sales ratio. I don't know if you want to say anything, Jane, about that. Well, we have begun our reassessment, period. Uh, we've just started it. We've just gotten our last sales, our recordations of sales from the clerk's office, and we're in the process now of getting those recorded and doing our ratios. Once that's done, we will look at the entire year and begin our forecasting from there. We'll also be taking into consideration the third quarter billing permits, which I hope will be finished this week, uh, the revenue is better than what I had anticipated, and we're also, I can look forward to the fourth <coughs> quarter. I also know that fourth quarter is going to be much higher than what we anticipated also. And we don't have that information, but look what the state did. I mean, they, they uh, in effect, raised our tax rate by a penny. Uh, between the last session of the General Assembly and the start of this session, we had to write a check for six hundred thousand bucks. That's a, that's a penny. We don't do fractions of a penny, so that's not good news at all. But again, at this point in time, we don't want to overestimate. If we overestimate anything, we want to overestimate the expenditures so that if we're surprised, we're surprised the right way. Yeah, yeah. As, as soon as we can, we, we you know these question marks are gonna gonna. Start filling in. G gonna gonna tell, right. tell tell the story most of them, but what I don't want to happen is we got to adopt the budget. Well, second by in May. We, we, we got, yes. we, we, I don't want us to start making no decisions in, in May. I mean, as soon as, as soon as we can, because f like you just said about the sports hall of fame. Well, I can make that one right now, but but <laughs> but, but but I'm saying don't 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 have us backed up to May with no, one sir. meeting to deliberate. 
to you. Uh, that is so good. That's why we're doing this. We want your input. We want you to tell us. So, 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 my, so I'm saying if, if these question marks come in, if one comes in next week and one we come in the next week, don't hold them. We, 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 need, we need to know them as we, as we go along. So we can. And let's look at that last page at this. I asked Carol to put together um, what's discretionary and what's not discretionary. You know the debt service is not discretionary. These are numbers you're assuming? Yes, sir. What, what, what are these things? Yeah, right. Carol, can you go? So ahead? this assumes, I mean, this looks at certain expenditures um, and <laughs> makes the assumption that they're, they're, dis they're non-discretionary, meaning either, either they can't be cut or it's just um, very unlikely that, that um, council and the community would be willing to cut them. Um, the school's baseline budget is $51.2 million. That's a big chunk of it. Um, debt service, we're legally obligated to pay. Um, the constitutional offices, we, we have both a local portion and a, um, a state-funded portion. So the only portion we could impact there would be the local, and we're, those offices are providing services to the public that um, the public values. Um, we've got the, the ARC for our, our city um, pension plans, jail per diem. We have other regional contracts, including HRT. Um, and these, I just give you examples of the largest ones, but, you know, we've got line of duty for public safety, which is a requirement. Um, we've, we've got things like the, um, the, the registrar and the assessor's office, which um, are either mandated or are tied to, to revenue production. Um, so when you subtract all of that out, you're left with $90.1 million of discretionary money, and of that, 55% is public safety. So, you know, I think it's fair to say that you know, the city does not offer a highly rich um, suite of, of services. We, we are offering, you know, basic services. So when you go in to look at where, where cuts can be made, it, it becomes really challenging. And during the last round of um, recessionary cuts, there were a number of... Um, you know, impacts to services that, that never were undone. So it, it just, um, when, when, you, when you look at the um, shortfall as a percent of our total budget, it, it's a very different thing than looking at it as a percent of our discretionary budget. Paige, to answer your question, Roz found the PowerPoint presentation that we did on OPEB, mm -hmm. and it brings it down. We were projecting to 40 million, 445,000 Dollars. Really? Uh, four, forty million four hundred and eighty-eight thousand. Brings it down to forty million. Yes, sir. Oh, that's with a and corresponding that's, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's and Trump. That's impressive. Yeah. And that's why. It is. Yeah. The rating agencies so all look favorably upon yeah, that. Yeah, but you know, and that's another mm -hmm. thing. We, I'm going to cut my email off. Carol sends me an email today. That Moody wants to reevaluate where we are based on uh, sea level uh, rise and the impact oh, that will have on the flooding. And so, you know, that's that's an exercise that uh, it's going to be interesting. Well, that's a, that's a no win situation right there. But 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 that but that number does make this one question mark going to be a little more favorable than, than we well, would anticipate. Yeah, and, and our goal would be to fully fund the R for OPEP. Yeah. Uh, so that we can beat on our chest when we go up to, to New York and, and tell the rating agencies, we, we promised you this, and we are delivering. Hey, we have delivered. We're good on our word. Yeah, because keep in mind that Moody still has us on negative outlook. They, we've been on negative outlook with them since we um, went through the last rating evaluation, so that's something we need to just be cognizant of. Yeah. So, uh, where are we on the balance in the rainy day fund? Well, we presented, and we'll, we can send um, council this information again. We, um, when we presented the CAFR, we went over where we are with our, our fund balance. And after subtracting out the 15% council policy for emergencies and all of the, the appropriations to date and a couple that we knew were coming up, we were at about $5 million. And um, it's important to keep in mind that we, we have been trying to transition to cash funding our CIP projects. In the past, the city had debt funded almost all of them. 
we, as you can see, we don't have the capacity really for any more debt service. And they were funding projects that were really more maintenance in, in nature. Ideally, when you're debt funding something, it should be um, something that has a life at least as long as the debt service that you're going to be paying on it. So we're trying to um, use leftover um, fund balance at the end of each year and reprogram that into our capital projects fund. And by statute, what balance needs to remain in the rainy day fund? There, there is no legal requirement, but there are best practices. And, um, and several years ago, in conjunction with the fi city's financial advisor, council adopted a set of financial policies, and those are um, prudent financial practices to guide the, the way we manage our, our budget and finances. And a 15% um, emergency fund was established as part of those policies. 15% of? Of the following year um, general fund budget. We'll send you that PowerPoint presentation that uh, was given back in <coughs> December the 9th. Yeah. Because it has, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Well, but that number hovers around $30 million, I believe. Yeah, I think it was that 30, somewhere 33 around last 30, time. 33 million last time. So, anyway, yeah, Dan. Well, I'm definitely of the opinion that, um, and I couldn't support a budget that would not uh, increase um, the funding for our schools. Um, we've, we face significant <coughs> cuts. Our students um, are, are seeing that. Um, I'm seeing it on the other end as a college professor, um, what, what is happening educationally. Um, so I, there's no way I would support a budget that the uh, city manager could not present to us um, where you've worked it out where we have a consistent increase. I think it's time that the council needs to seriously consider some type of revenue sharing plan um, for the school system as far as um, it being a certain percentage of that general fund that the schools should expect to get at least each year. I, th I think it's serious time to have that type of conversation um, because we, we can't afford uh, to continue uh, to fund education at the level we're seeing it. So I just want to okay. express That's, that. And I, know I don't know if that has been a conversation. Well, uh, we've had it for years, and when I came in, there was a big discussion. Prior to me coming on council, I was on the finance committee, and uh, there was all these historical uh, promises that uh, I think the number was 35 percent, right. and we never got to that. I think Dan Pendarvis used to be the bulldog that constantly reminded us that we never got to the level that we all agreed to. And so I don't know where we got. I think we might have got 30 percent at one time. Right. Or, but we never reached the level that no, we supposedly was, previous never. councils had said we would do. And so... Uh, again, if you're not going to put some teeth in it, just making a promise and and, and delivering it, you know. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and, 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 that, and that's one of the reasons why uh, what he talked about leaving leaving those one-time monies in there to to, to affect some kind of increase. Because if we took the one-time monies out that we gave the school system last year, it would that that would, most most people would consider that level of funding because that's what they start the year out. So they're keeping that money in there. To, to actually yeah, boost it. Yeah, it's $6.4 million in and that you took the one-time shot. You took the word time on that. So, so, when you, so that was when part you all of adopted that supplemental appropriation, many of you uh, thought that that was a one-time appropriation. And we took the assumption for this presentation and for doing our budget that it's not a one-time, that it's part of the base. And, and Please do not leave tonight thinking that this John's making a pitch to reduce the funding for the schools, because I'm not. Uh, but I want you to, to understand where we are in the total scheme of our budget. So that 51.2 includes the 6.4? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I think we've in the past yeah. been around 45, 46 million. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like four. Prior to, we were at about 50 yeah. million. That's and right. I think that number probably needs to stay at the 50 million and not hover down. Yeah, because we're around 43 for, for last last year, 43 for four. So that 6.4 plus that other other 1.3 mm -hmm. 
million. No, the 1.8, I think, yeah. brings it yeah. up to. And whatever we realize from uh, the uh, insurance yeah. transition, I mean, we know we got to ramp up on that, and we're not going to get a whole lot the first year, but the whole fact that we're doing the self-insured and all that. But that what, just started this week, right? It and did. It started January yeah. 1. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't saved any money yet. <laughs> it started. But, uh, yeah, yeah, right, well, while we're discussing you know, this, when are we going to have a serious presentation as far as a revenue sharing plan with the school system? Well, whatever you like. I mean, I, I think we need, as Paige said, we need to fill in some of these question marks to know how much money we're talking about because right now uh, there's no revenue to share. There is no revenue to share in this budget because there's a gap between expenditures and, and revenues the wrong way. Uh, expenditures exceed revenues as we face 2015 right now. Uh, when you take into consideration the best practices on your, on your fund balance, uh, you don't have much to share there either. Um, if you, we get a credit score just like uh, we, the municipal corporation, you, just like individuals. And the people who score us with Moody's, Standards and Poor, Fitch, and um, they would tell us that we are anemic on our fund balance. They want to see more fund balance. And as Carol told you, we've got Moody's that uh, is got us on a negative watch. And so it's not good news when they send us, we want to sit down and evaluate the impact of sea level rise on your community. Yeah. That's not good news. It's well, totally out of, our, out of our control. Yeah. 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 Well, right. well it's, it's not that we don't have revenue to share because we have a general fund. It's, it's a matter of are we going to put it at a higher priority. And, and so that's, that's what I'm saying because um, we, we always will have revenue because we have a general fund. So You always will have revenue because you have taxes. And I think the question becomes how much are you willing to devote of your taxes to anything, right. whether it's schools, whether it's public safety, whether it's libraries, whether it's uh, mental health. That's the question that you face as as a municipal corporation. It's not a Johnny, it's not a one-trick pony. This pony does a lot of tricks, and you've got to decide how much you're going to fund for all of these things. And which services you can afford to provide and which you can't. Right. Well, what, what I'm saying is that education is a priority, and as, as a city manager, um, the budget that we should see is education being funded as it should. And so what, whatever it takes to do that, that's what needs to be done. And if it's a recommendation of cuts or tax increase, that, that needs to be presented. Sure. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Now we're talking about schools. Let's go to the next thing on the agenda tomorrow night. It's a reappropriation of funds. We want to make sure that you understand the components that make up uh, this reappropriation. Plus, uh, Ross, there's a, a grant that's come in uh, since. Will you stand up, please? Uh, will you tell council about the grant? Uh, the schools, uh, first of all, good evening. The schools mm -hmm. received some additional fund for one of their Title I grants. It's about $29,000. So we're going to have that presented for one of council members Smith that under uh, pending items for tomorrow night. We want to go ahead and get this on the agenda tomorrow night so <clears throat> we'll have the uh, cover memo and the appropriations ordinance. And if you'll just add it to the end of the agenda uh, at the appropriate time, Deborah will tell you when to do that. <laughs> You're looking at me funny. <laughs> I'll stop talking. <laughs> but the okay. punchline is that we want you to appropriate those, those funds. Will you Perfect. tell them about the... The, um, yes, so the schools have come back with a uh, request to appropriate 599000 And um, you may recall that in fiscal year the, the 2013, we, um, we had booked as a receivable from the schools $408,125, which was money left over at the end of the year that had not been reappropriated by city council. So um, 
in order to appropriate the, the full amount that the schools are requesting, $408,125 is going to need to come from fund balance so that we can write off that receivable. And um, when we presented the, the projected fund balance to you in, in December, we assumed that council would be doing that. But I just wanted to make sure that you're aware that uh, the majority of that reappropriation is going to need to come from fund balance. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Let me, let me just the, the reappropriation that we're voting on um, tomorrow, the 599000 and some hundred, um, that is going to go back to the school system as categorical. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Right. Um, I would ask that the uh, council seriously consider, reconsider um, the funding of our schools on a categorical basis. Uh, it is placing a significant strain on the school system. There's really, there's really no logic justification uh, for why council is doing that because it's the school system's position to manage those funds, not, not the council. Um, you appropriate those funds to the schools to, to send it to us in a categorical basis um, causes the school system to have to make uh, decisions um, that has placed it in a great strain because traditionally prior to a, a couple years ago those funds could be shifted within the school district. Now because of categorical funding um, the schools have to come before the council and it's really an unnecessary process and I would hope the council would um, take into account the serious strain that that places on the school's uh, operations. Um, also, um, our other departments within the city, is that, a, is that the way that other departments are, are funded categorically? Oh, yes, sir. I All mean, of them? If you look at uh, any departmental budget, we'll have uh, categories. Right, we'll but I mean, is that how council funds them categorically? Yes, sir. That's okay. what I'm saying. It has salaries, supplies, transportation, maintenance. Uh, it's it's what's referred to as a line item budget. I mean, we don't give a lump sum to a department that says go out and do good work. I mean, it's so it's, so all the departments in the city are funded categorically. I can't think of one that's not. Can you? Well, when council when council adopts the the budget ordinance it's it's not at the line item level it's at the um, it's at the functional level so um, you know, general government judicial and, and all the departments that are included in those amounts are um, you know, are enumerated in the budget document so it's the the budgetary level of control is at the fund level and the, the city manager has the ability if if it's warranted to move money from one department to another. Right, but when council approves it, it's at the fund level. It, it, it's at the fund and right. the um, and the functional level, but th they have delegated the authority to the city manager within that total to to make adjustments as needed. Right, and, but, and so it's it's like I'm saying, it's when it comes before council, it's at the fund is at the fund level that it is approved. The, the ordinance um, has goes into more detail than just the fund. Yeah. It's, it's, Let us it's send you a copy of the ordinance so that you can, can see. But when we, for operationally, each department, police for example, has uh, a line item, and the police chief doesn't have the authority to make transfers within uh, his, he's got to get that authority. Right. I, I'm not doubting that. The, the issue I'm just raising is that when council, appro it, it, when council approves the budget, is at the fund level. For what Ms. Swindell just said, it was at the fund What you need level. to, yeah. I understand what you're asking council to do, and that's, that's your decision, not my decision. All right. Well, I thought that that was presented to council as a way Remember of funding the schools. Remember the genesis for this. It came out of the grand jury report. Right. Okay. Right. And that's what council decided to do. Not, not John Rowe. Not the city manager. Council decided this. Well, then, council well, then I think as a council we need to to reverse that. Um, I don't unless unless council can share what's the logic behind why we're doing categorical funding to our schools yeah. when the schools are 
letting us know that that's placing a significant strain on their operations. I think, first of all, I'm going to correct you. You said we, you said we, and we is now us, not them. What you, you You were talking about we, the school board, and you're we, the city council. No, Remember I'm, that I'm still, I, Remember I, have that children, I have children in the school Remember system. That so, no, I have children in the school system, so I can say we. Well, we all have children in the well, school system. Well, I was correct. But, yeah. but you know, I was going to say, and I think I'm going to say what John just said. You were kind of asking him. That decision was made by us. And it was based on the recommendation of the grand jury for us to keep a, a, a watch and be more careful about the way we were appropriating money, which is what the grand jury instructed us to do. And I think when the full council is here, as we have budget discussions, you've got a point you want to make, and we'll talk about it. It's not up to John at all. Right. Okay. Well, that's why. That's why I'm saying. So I think the point council. Taken and I we'll think talk the council about should it. reconsider. Disagree, uh, but we'll talk about I it. I think the council should reconsider that and and look at that. And and also, um, the grand jury a uh, grand jury does not dictate what a council does. So I just just want to put that on. We the read table. their report and he did their recommendation. Yeah. Yeah, me, yep, so, right. But he brought up one point I wanted. Yeah. Where are we getting that that's putting a strain on the schools? Have they brought that back to us yet? Yes, they have. Yes, they have. Okay. We, I, that, I, that has been said. Okay. Um, and um, as... as um, because part of the rationale with our discussions was that doing the first on a quarterly basis that they came and said we needed to move something yeah. from here to there we, we weren't no going to yeah we said no problem we weren't going to create a strain but we wanted to I think the consensus of the council was to put these things in categories so everybody had some kind of idea of where funds were being expended because I don't think council had the confidence that the school system knew where they were and we certainly didn't and so I think that was, I mean, I was on the losing end of that battle because I, I wasn't in favor, but I think that's speaking for the council, the direction that we were trying to get at, just to see categorically where all these things go. But there right. was never a, I don't, yeah. And I, I think one of the points that I argued, Dr. Whitaker, was we didn't want that strain. And I think this council said they won't have that strain. If the schools come and say, hey, we need to move this thing over here because of that, we weren't going to get into a, argument we'd say okay move it but we wanted to get from what my understanding a year under our belt of seeing where the things washed out and 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 what opportunities exist so even though i was on the losing end i kind of quieted down because it didn't create that strain so when you say strain that's why i was asking yeah so right because uh, as you know those requests have to come before council they're not immediately approved Mm -hmm. And so in that time period process, operations within the school are Go still on. going on. Right. And so to wait for that to occur, if it's, if it's something that's going to automatically be done, then I don't see the necessity of, of that continued um, okay. oversight. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. Hi, John. I've used this metaphor before. You're in the bottling business where you create a... a a beverage that is consumed and people expect that to be safe uh, when you turn your tap on at home you're you don't want to get sick um, and so uh, all the components uh, from supply to distribution to uh, the water coming in through the tap are important com components we have a component that uh, is in jeopardy and that is the groundwater we get our source of supply for this product that we produce uh, from two major sources. One is surface water, lakes, and the other is groundwater. Uh, years ago, four and a half decades ago, when I got in this business, the state did not regulate municipal governments in the withdrawal of groundwater from uh, the underground aquifer. It does now. And because more is being pumped out of the aquifer than is being replenished, uh, the state wants to come in and reduce the permits. And that could have a negative impact on us. And so we want to brief you on where we are uh, on this. Brian, will you come up, please? Brian. Tell me we're not going through all of this. Yeah, we are. We'll do it quickly. Well, okay. I, I know 
you're it's concerned there's a football game on tonight, I think probably that's <laughs> going to start pretty soon. Yeah. Um, I will oh, do, is there a game? I, I, I didn't know that. I heard that somewhere. Um, so okay. I, I will do my best. I will go through this. I'll try to, to – it's it's – can be somewhat technical and tedious, and I'll try not to, okay. to bore you with details. But uh, Happy New Year, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Hope you had a nice holiday. We're going to talk about our groundwater permitting. Um, basically, I'm going to give you an overview for the – make sure you're familiar with the, the system and talk to you about what DEQ is doing um, and the process that we're having to go to, through and, and the path forward um, for this process. Um, just a little bit of a, a, a primer, just to go over a couple of definitions. We're talking about an aquifer, we're talking about, of course, what's underground. Um, uh, it's just like a, a homeowner in a rural area might have a well for their home. That's the same thing, just up much on a much larger scale um, as far as what the city would, would do. Um, confining unit, that's where, that's where the, the aquifer ends or, the, or, the, or might divide the layers between uh, uh, what's um, unconfined at the top versus what's confined um, below. And I'll have a graphic here to show you. A million gallons per day. Um, you've heard, I know with flooding and, and some of those discussions, um, we've had talk about salt water intrusion. That's an issue with the groundwater. Salt water is more dense. And when you deplete the ground, the freshwater groundwater aquifer, that salt water tends to want to intrude into that freshwater aquifer, which then, of course, causes problems um, in terms of contaminating um, for drinking water purposes. And then you'll hear us talk about water quality issues as well as, as we move through. Um, this is, um, I'll give credit to Mr. Rowe um, <laughs> for, for this drawing um, <laughs> that sort of uh, gives us a uh, description as far as the aquifer. Um, I know he stood out of you. Would you like to uh, yeah. go um, over this? This is a cross section. <clears throat> Assume that you could cut away a slice of the earth and look down a thousand feet. I 95 is important because that's the fall line for all the rivers that flow to the Chesapeake Bay. It's where bedrock comes out of the ground. Uh, above the fall line, you have reasonably flat rivers. Below the fall line, you have reasonably flat rivers. So I-95 acts as where the bedrock comes out of the ground and it travels on a slope that goes like this to where it gets to the Atlantic Ocean. It's about a thousand feet below the surface. Okay, this is the ground right here. So you got an image of what we're talking about? At the, at the top, you have the upper aquifer that is fed by the rain. And it goes down about a, a hundred feet. And that's where if you wanted to go to Sears or go to the hardware store and get a pump, you'd put it down, you get water, maybe at 4 feet, 10 feet, 12 feet. Uh, but at 100 feet, give or take, and we're talking generalities, there's a clay lens, a clay lens that runs from Interstate 95 all the way to the ocean. And so that's the barrier right here. And the barrier down here is bedrock. So those are the two confining units. Now, you've heard the term artesian well. Years ago, the water, and the water is fed into this aquifer, not through rain, because you have this clay lens that acts like this glass top, a barrier. It's fed west to east. Years ago, when this was under pressure, you could put a well into this aquifer. There was enough water pressure that it would naturally flow out of the well. It was under pressure. It would be like me taking the top off here, putting a, uh, a straw in and squeezing it. Water would come out the straw. Um, the problem is, is that no one knows with any precision how much water is in that aquifer. And we're talking about from the North Carolina boundary all the way up to Maryland and from Interstate 95. And so you got a, a vast number of users. Uh, if you lived in Suffolk at Quailaville on a 30-acre farm, you don't have a water system. You're going to have a deep well. If you're West Point, you got the paper mill. They use as much groundwater per day as we use in Portsmouth. 
they use 20 million gallons per day. So they're pumping out 20 million do uh, gallons per day out of this. This is just one user. And the concern is, is that you point it, you pump it so much that you've got the pressure of salt water being intruding into here. And then nobody can use the water. So um, the aquifer, like John was saying, goes from uh, 95 to the ocean. Um, it's, it has different, uh, it's a, got a shallow end, so closer to 95 up on the peninsula, it's a lot shallower. Here it's a lot deeper. So DEQ um, hydraulically models the entire aquifer to see what people's impacts are. And so depending on where you're located and how much you withdraw, <coughs> you can have a different impact on the aquifer um, and, and, and the amount that gets withdrawn. So our water supply, like um, Mr. Rowe mentioned, We've got lakes, we've got five deep wells uh, that pump groundwater. We also have an emergency pipeline from Norfolk. Um, we only use that in drought emergencies. That was put in about uh, 2003. We've only had to use it a couple of times since then, um, but that's there. We have a contract with Norfolk if we need it to get some water uh, uh, during those drought, uh, extreme droughts. We have four lakes out in South of Kilby, Cahoon, Mead, and Spates Run, and the safe yield. Uh, from the lakes is 19.4 million gallons per day. Safe yield meaning how much you can safely withdraw and it will naturally replenish itself and you don't have to worry about uh, de decreasing those, those levels. So here they, here um, are the lakes. It's kind of hard to see. On this, this is downtown Suffolk right here. And <coughs> is that better? You want to point out? Yeah. So, so here are the four lakes. It's sort of a horseshoe shape here. Um, our water treatment plant uh, is right here. This is Lake Kilby. Our water treatment plant is right here. Across the street is Lipton T, if you know that part of uh, downtown Suffolk. Cahoon is our largest lake, uh, and then Lake Mead. And then here, there's a dam, and so all the overflow, when they're completely full, will goes into the Nansman River. Yeah, this is the Nansman River that flows north out to uh, the Hampton Roads. So those are, um, those are our four lakes. We also have um, five uh, groundwater wells. We use two for in our daily production. We have three that we use only in the time of drought. And our groundwater is integral to our process because it provides um, uh, the natural fluoridation. Our, uh, the, the, the groundwater is high in fluoride, so we can naturally fluoridate our water supply. We don't have to apply it chemically. Um, and um, Again, the DEQ regulates that withdrawal, and we are currently, as are most of our peers, most everybody, in, uh, are operating without an approved DEQ permit. It has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with them. We have filed all the proper uh, forms and paperwork. Um, the last required um, uh, application was in 2004, and here we are 10 years later, and we're, and we're now um, getting to the point of, of going through a renewal. Um, here are five wells. They vary in age. The oldest dates back to the 1950s. Our newest one, well number three, um, uh, we actually that we acquired that well in '76, but um, we had to drill a new well uh, close to the original one. And you can see the varying depths from 650 to uh, 820 feet, um, and then the various capacities. We have 15 million gallons uh, a day of capacity if we were operating all of those wells wide open that's about what we would be withdrawing and, and so think about we're doing the, 20 million a day uh, that's from the lakes yeah, that, yeah. how much of that 20 is coming out of this 15 our, our av well our, right now we're averaging uh, right around 3 mgd of groundwater okay. um, and, and our daily average daily production is around 17 and a half now we'll peak <clears throat> hot on a summer day and of course and actually some of our peaks are in the winter when it's cold people leave their but you've got running. the capacity in the lakes to go 20 without yes. doing any damage to replenish right. so you don't really need to do the the, well, the well water or hey, do you remember the drought of 85 mm -hmm. uh, our lakes were ugly mm -hmm. I mean they looked like a moonscape because when those lakes were created, they just cut the clear cut the trees and they fell into the lake, and it, it looked macabre. It, it had all these tree limbs coming out of the bottom, and uh, Portsmouth had to rely on its wells in order to get through. 
And so on a normal day, like Brian said, we don't have, we use the, the, the wells for water quality. Uh, groundwater in that, um, that slide on the aquifer, um, two things you have to be concerned around here. One is fluoride. And fluoride is a regulated element uh, and it uh, occurs in a compound. And it helps your teeth be hard, but too much can have a negative health effect. And the sign, if you look at people from Franklin, they have yellow teeth. It's called mottled teeth. And it's because they get their water from a high fluoride well. The other thing that you find, you find different chemical properties in the strata of the, of the aquifer. Uh, sodium is a high uh, compound that you might find that's naturally there. So you don't want salt water to intrude. But the punchline is, is that we use, we use wells today to treat our finished water so that we have the right pH and the right amount of fluoride so that we have... So what you're pulling out of the wells, you're not treating it to plant? We only have to disinfect uh, with, with, the, with the chlorine. So it, it, it comes straight into our process when it, and it helps the finished process, like Mr. Rose said, with fluoride and pH. But all the chemical treatment is done strictly upstream, of, upstream of, that. of that. So pictorially, you would tie in the well water on the outward nozzle yes, of sir. all of the process exactly. tied in. The, okay. Right. So these are our well locations. You can see there. Uh, there's one up the top of your screen uh, behind the shopping center there in Suffolk. But again, they're all around our lakes. Uh, wells one and two pump right into the plant. They do not go into the lake first. They go right into our treatment process. Three, four, and five are our drought wells. And if we're pumping them, that water is just feeding into the lake. And then when we, we'll, we do our normal withdrawal from the lake. Um, and so we use those to supplement the supply. So, Are they running all the time? Oh. Uh, one, in, one uh, well, two is our primary well, and that does run pretty much twenty. And that, because we're a twenty-four-seven operation, um, we've got folks um, at the plant all day, every day, um, doing that process. And that, and so, well number two uh, runs all the time, and then we supplement from well number one uh, from a process standpoint, depending on what our demands are. Okay, and this just gives you. Uh, an idea of the history of the groundwater management that the state has uh, put in place. It starts back in 1973, and they came up with what's called the Groundwater, the groundwater <coughs> Management Act, GMA. And over the years, that area, that footprint's been expanded, and roughly it covers, again, from the coast to 95, from Carolina up to, to uh, Maryland. Um, and again, in 1973, municipal governments did not have to get a permit. We do have to get permits now. And this is what the n nature of this briefing is. They want to cut back on our per permit if we have one. All right. This gives you the history where we are in 2014. Um, they wanted to do cuts. This just graphically, this sh shows the area in green. This is that entire regulated area uh, that DEQ models. And so when we, even though here we are, excuse me, here we are down in Portsmouth, our wells are in Suffolk. So even though we're pulling water here, it has an effect on the whole aquifer, as does everybody else's withdrawals. And that's what they model. Um, and so that shaded area in green is the area that we're talking about. i give you about. some idea of how much, again, I'll pick on West Point. They pull 10 million gallons, I mean 20 million gallons a day. That's as much as we sell to all of our customers in Portsmouth, Chesapeake, and Suffolk. Visualize this. If you built a canal from here to Suffolk that's five feet deep, about five feet wide, it would go beyond Suffolk. That would be 20 million gallons worth of water. Mm -hmm. So it's a heck of a lot of water. Yeah, we that's could, being pulled out just by one user. We could fill we could fill this building about three and a half times a day, the volume of this six-story building, and that to help give you an image of what 20 million gallons represents. Um, so why is DEQ they're proposing cuts because the groundwater level is declining. There's a concern about land subsidence. They they, they you know with they're drawing down the aquifer. You know, the, the, having land subsidence, saltwater intrusion, we've already talked about. 
it's being pumped out faster um, than it can be replenished. The hydraulic models indicates that that's not sustainable. Um, and um, in tech, did they, the DEQ had a study done by Virginia Tech in 2014 examining um, this issue as well and some of what the financial implications are because it's a resource that we all share. Um, even though it's something that we want to take advantage of, everybody has to share it, and it's not in anyone's best interest if we just let it get depleted. So that's where, that's where they're coming from. Um, the next slide I'm getting ready to show you just illustrates um, how the decline um, that uh, is taking place. It's a busy slide, but uh, what's going to happen? Yeah. It's too busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Too busy. What number were you on? Uh, 17. Please. So the pro cuts that they're proposing while she's booting back up, is it proportional, percentage? I mean, we're only tapping $3 million a day. Right. And somebody else is doing 50 There you go. There, yeah. So, so this, is, this, is just, um, this is just showing you, all, all the intent of this is just to show you. Uh -oh. um, there we go. That's it. Um, the very in various areas and, and this axis right here is 1970 and so you can look at the curve the water levels at all different spots in the aquifer have been on the the climb and, and, yeah. And, and, yeah and it's it's for the last 40 years mm -hmm. so uh the, the the regulatory dilemmas not sustainable permits have expired need to be reissued most of us do not, in Portsmouth and most of the other permit holders, don't meet the technical criteria to have a permit reissued. Because when you look at the negative impact because they've had the decline, what you're withdrawing, uh, and what they're modeling, of course, is even though you might not be using all of your permitted value, you saw we were permitted for $15 million. We don't use that much, but that's what they have to model. And so nobody meets the technical criteria. So they were trying to come up with a way to what, how can we reissue these permits um, so everybody can um, still be able to use groundwater because 90% of what's permitted is, for, is, is from 14 large users of, what, of which Portsmouth is one. So they want to reduce the amount that's being withdrawn, which will stabilize the, stabilize the level, that, that decline that we showed you so the, the water level will stabilize. Try to reduce or eliminate these critical cells, these, these areas that are, in essence, going dry the little cells within the aquifer, and then issue all the permits at once. Um, we met with them. They don't want to restrict their, their goals. They don't want to uh, restrict so people can't operate. They don't want to eliminate anybody's permit, and they want to have this equitable reduction that you were talking about, Mr. Mayor, how they were, how they were doing that. Here are your 14 largest users. It's both private industry and municipalities. It ranges from Rock 10 at the very top, which is the paper mill in West Point, 20 MGD a day user. Um, IP over in Franklin, um, they're not as large as they used to be in terms of withdrawals, but they're another large user. But as far as it's Norfolk, it's Portsmouth, James City County Service Authority, um, Chesapeake, um, Smithfield, Smithfield Foods, all of these folks are large groundwater users. So here's the cuts we're talking about. You can see on the chart, um, Portsmouth is um, 50, permitted for 15.4, uh, right, we're only averaging about 2.9. They want to cut us and only permit us for three and a half. Um, and so... Um, so we got a capacity of 15, we're only using three, so they're saying, okay, we're going to set your level at three. That's correct. So shit, if we have been using five, they would have come back and set it at five? Well, not that. necessarily, because yeah. it, it, because if you, you'll see both the two that are hit the worst, Look at the James Rock City. 10 and West Point and James City, mm -hmm. they're actually getting cut oh, yeah, okay. yeah. below, below what they're actually using. And both of those are up on the peninsula. That's the shallower end of the aquifer. Mm -hmm. There's more of a negative impact um, to the aquifer in that area. So they're trying to be equitable, but it does affect different people differently. If you look at it as on a percentage basis, Portsmouth's actually getting the largest percentage cut because our, our permitted use is so much higher than what our actual usage so, is. So I'm reading that right. Um, West Point's getting cut half? They want to get West Point down to a 10 MGD. That's what, the, that's what they're targeting them at. That's correct. So some, so some folks are, are getting uh, more pain than others. 
Um, so what were West Point permitted at? If they're they're doing permitted tw- at 23. Okay. 23, and they're, they're mm-hmm. tapping about 20. Okay, right. I got you. That, yeah. So um, that's, 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 that's the dilemma that we're facing. So on the one hand, you say, well, maybe it's not so bad for Portsmouth. But the, the, the issue for us is that in times of drought, we use a lot more than three. And we want to be able to continue that um, in, in those events when that, if that were to happen. So, so, so what? So what? Are, are we going back with them to them with something? Oh yeah, right. That says yeah. we so, got we got major facilities in our city that if we reduce the water, the naval hospital is going to have a problem. You know, we're using that. Well, kind of- that's that's one argument. Because if you have a drought, you don't have these backup wells, what do you do? You put water restrictions on. Right. It says you can't wash your clothes. You right. can't uh, use this much water. Oh. And if you do, there are sanctions. But go back and, to the chart, because yes, looking sir. at the city of Norfolk, they're, they're not doing anything. And if we get in an extreme drought and we can't go above our, our two or three million there, can we count on them? Um, but most likely, yes. They, Norfolk they, say no, no, no Keep day? in mind, Norfolk mm-hmm. is um, they're the water provider for Virginia Beach. I understand. And so that and Lake Gaston project <coughs> that the beach put in that that has that's uh, um, sixty million gallons a day. Gift that keeps on giving. That, that, that comes over. Yeah. Those go into that water goes into Norfolk's lakes. And that then, pipe actually ends uh, in Windsor, but the watershed for the Norfolk lakes pick up if you. There's an industrial park on the left, about right there is where it picks up. So that's why they're not doing any tapping into the wells. We're showing zero there, right. even though they were permitted for almost yeah. three, almost four, now, four million. Prior, prior to Lake Gaston, their lakes are the same place as ours, mm-hmm. and they had the same reaction. Mm-hmm. So when we had a drought, all those lakes looked right. looked mm-hmm. bad. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. So, so um, we met with the, so the, these fourteen large. Users, we've sort of banded together. We're working together, working through the PDC, both public and private entities. And we 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 got together. We met with David Paler, who's the director of DEQ, and his staff in Richmond back in November. And we talked with them about this issue because they, all of us, have had a meeting individually with DEQ where they sort of showed us the information, said, "Well, this is the cut you're looking looking at," and sort of dropped the bomb, if you will. Uh, and so we've we've collectively talked with our peers, and we've met with DEQ. We were asking for more time to evaluate alternatives. Um, DEQ is in, insistent that the permits need to be written um, this coming year. This slide says by the summer. It's actually slid now to more like the end of 2015, um, and that you know their assessment is that the our withdrawals are doing real damage to the aquifer, and they're trying to. Um, reduce that negative impact. And the permits, um, the ones that need to reduce, they've given them a few years in order to make that reduction. Um, We um, are, uh, they want to concurrently hold uh, meetings with individuals. They want to ask us, what are you going to do? They're willing to listen to the regional solution, but they're not going to slow down the process. Um, And so we've, we've, uh, we've gotten a call they're ready for us to schedule our next meeting. We haven't scheduled it yet. Um, we wanted to brief council, but that's coming up. Um, we've there. We've there's uh, potentially some legislation that may come this general assembly for uh, to study this issue and have an advisory committee. Uh, and part of that leg- early draft of the legislation says, you know, they can't. We've no cuts for two years or three years while this study's taking place. Um, but then it doesn't say what happens after that um, in terms of it just it's just delaying potentially delaying what's going to happen in terms of what they're um, suggesting but we all agree that a, um, a long-term solution is needed because the aqua I mean, it's, it's, it's shared resource for everyone so this is the impact we talked about 3 MGD what our paper cut would be but we, we're using more than that um, What's next? Again, we're meeting collectively. We're, we're going to continue to do that. We're going to we're going to argue our case to DEQ. But um, that you see what our reality is. They're ba- they're saying, look, you're not using this water. We're giving you we're giving you a cut, but um, and how and how we deal with that. And that's the that's the argument that we need to make. 
Let's segue from here uh, to <coughs> that's the source. Let's look at the transmission mains. If you'll take this uh, paper handout. Um, the next critical component of our water system is how to get the finished product that we finish in Suffolk to Portsmouth. And we're always paying attention. It's like the blood flow to the brain. If you cut your, your artery in your neck, the brain's not going to get any, uh, any blood. If we have a cut to our transmission mains, we can go dry here in Portsmouth. That impacts not only the faucet in your home, but Beck's ability to fight fires. And so we are continually looking at what the needs are. We had just finished a study that um, the punchline is is going to be a cost of $65 million to make these improvements, but they don't have to be, all be made on day one. Uh, they get s stretched out over 15 years. And these would rise to the level of being debt finance uh, projects. So let's go to page three. All right, so um, we have... Okay, what is that? <laughs> I just hit the arrow. So we have, um, uh, in essence, uh, uh, two, uh, two transmission systems. We have one that, that brings water from Suffolk um, over to this, this side of the water, what we call downtown Portsmouth, uh, basically runs along the 58 corridor. Um, and then we have a, 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 another that runs from Suffolk sort of cross country over to Churchland. Um, and, and of course they are interconnected uh, once you are in Portsmouth, but basically there's a low pressure side and a high pressure side, and they sort of, for the most part, operate um, somewhat independently of each other. The oldest portion dates back to the 1890s, and that's still in use. This is what I was talking about just very briefly. This is Suffolk. Here's the water plant. Our lines go through downtown Suffolk, under the streets, through a couple of the different neighborhoods. Then you have the two, you have a 30 and a 42 inch come up and then go into Churchland all the way to the Churchland tank up on Cedar Road. And then the other... Is that the high pressure leg? This is the high pressure leg. Okay. The low pressure leg um, uh, goes is three lines uh, in parallel. A 30 and 220s. They generally run along the 58 corridor through the Dismal Swamp, and they go to Frederick Boulevard to our pump station. There, that's the two tanks you see uh, uh, across from the compound there, right on next to 264. And while we have this slide up, they run adjacent to a rail road, so they're. Uh, that's one of the considerations when you look at something like this. What danger, what threat does the railroad pose? If they have a derailment, does it impact, mm -hmm. can it uh, cause failure to our transmission main? So again, high pressure, it just kind of goes through. You can see this is the younger of the system. A lot of it dates to the 60s. The, uh, the 42 inches, a newer section that was put in in uh, 92. The low pressure side, this is the this is the his, this is the original system when when we bought the water system from the private water company. This is what was put in to serve the uh, the shipyard, the naval hospital back in the late 1800s. Um, three lines, um, they're interconnected at 12 different locations, uh, and the youngest is 1950s here, and that's the reinforced concrete. The RCP is reinforced concrete pipe. What are our challenges? Uh, we don't have as-built drawings for a lot of that stuff. It, again, it's 120 years old or more. Um, reliability of the pipes in downtown Suffolk, that's our oldest part of the system. It's difficult making repairs and when, you, when the lines are traversing the dismal swamp. And then there's somewhat of a restricted ability to move water between Churchill and downtown. Remember I told you they're sort of two independent. We have a line on the West Norfolk Bridge. We've got a line on the Churchland Bridge. The line goes underneath there at Hodges Ferry. And that's what moves water, and, and you can only um, uh, move so much uh, in, in either direction. So the study, we wanted to, again, uh, we, we like to make sure, uh, because of the age and, and sort of the historic issues with some leaks, is on, what started it was looking at the low pressure side, the really old part. We wanted to model the system, determine where all strengths and weaknesses are, you know, verify capacity, understand the condition, and, and we want to improve reliability and redundancy so we don't, so one single point of failure doesn't cause a problem for the entire system. Um, 
And so that's kind of, that's, that was what we looked at, but we wanted, we wanted to make sure it was a holistic approach. We didn't want to just focus on the low pressure side. We wanted to look at the entire system and make sure, even though we had some that's relatively young, are there issues that could uh, cause us problems down the road. So we also want to make sure if there's anything that might impact the treatment plan, if we had to do change to the transmission system, is it going to impact the treatment plant and what changes might we have to make there? looked at what implementation and costs and estimating uh, what those things would be. Um, so our criteria, we looked at, you know, our main goal was risk reduction. We looked at two things, What's the, the, the likelihood of failure and the consequence of failure. How likely is something to fail? That's where the age component, um, those kinds of things get it, uh, that come into play. But also, what's the consequence of failure? Even if it's a brand new line, if it was to fail, is that, is, you know, is, that a, is that a point that would cause us a problem? So we're looking at both of those in conjunction. And then it was tied to our hydraulic model so, you know, that we have making sure we can get water to all the various places it needs to in the appropriate volume. And so all of that was tied together as far as evaluating. And then we looked at all the possible solutions um, and uh, our consultant, CH2M Hill, that did this work for us, to have an algorithm to put all that in and really evaluate all the possible combinations of improvements and really optimize and make sure we're getting the improvements that we need at the, at the least cost so we can be most efficient with what's being um, required. Uh, so we've developed a comprehensive plan for upgrades. We've identified the deficiencies and risk elements that we wanted to resolve. We gave us five um, major alternatives for improvement. And so this is what it shows. So the areas in red are the areas of criticality. You can see the entire, that entire low pressure system coming in is a critical area. You also have some sections up here. Um, and that's more a consequence of failure because of um, lack of redundancy um, and then some fire flow issues as well as far as just some volume, making sure we need to upsize some pipes and have appropriate volume. That's kind of graphically showing you what our issues are. So this is the chart there that's in your handout on page 13. Like I said, there were five options, two baseline options, which basically were to either um, replace the um, low pressure system, that was sort of our baseline reference, or to line it, and that's the two price difference of lining, it's a little cheaper, that was uh, baseline two. And then the uh, other... You get the notion of lining, it's like putting a stent in an artery, you line the inside. <coughs> okay. So we had the, the other three options, option A, and then we had two va variations on <coughs> option B. Um, and you can see the, the um, green, the area of shading green means, with a yes means it's, it's, it's eliminating our deficiency, our risk element. Um, uh, and option A, uh, which is about 65 million, <coughs> that is the option that is, we feel is best. Now you're probably saying, well, wait a second, there's, there's, one of the, there's a no in one of those boxes. That is addressing the issue that Mr. Rowe just mentioned, this consequence of failure um, on the low pressure side because the veins are relatively close to one another. Um, but the likelihood of something happening to where that is, is very, very low. They've been there for 100, over 125 years and nothing's really, you know, the, 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 the consequence is really low. And that's sort of a, a confidence level that we have. So the question is, do you want to spend 30 or 40 million dollars more to eliminate a consequence that we think is probably very, very unlikely to occur. And it's so like, is that's that $30 million dollar risk. Yeah. It, yeah. It's risk assessment. It hasn't happened in 120 years. It's what you do with your car. You know, do you want it, uh, a deductible or, or do you want the full insurance? And we think that if the risk is sufficiently small that we don't need to address those lines, we could save 30 to $40 million. We address the risk by improving them with the lining, but the consequence in terms of actually do we need to relocate them or move them further apart, that's the part we're not choosing to address. So, What do you get from a life cycle uh, perspective from new versus lining it? If we line it, we get, what, another 50 years? Uh, do new, we can go another 150 years? Well, it depends, it depends on the material chosen, um, but the, the lining that we're talking about is... Um, HDPE, 
and it's um, which which is a thick walled um, plastic, um, and and actually, it will it's inside the um, the pipe. We would be um, pulled through, and it actually would be structurally independent. So it's not going to rely on the existing pipe for its integrity, um, and and by doing that. Um, you don't you don't have to excavate as much, and you can um, uh, improve the life. How thick is it? The line. Um, I'm gonna. We have our consultant Eric Nice from Eric, Sears. Can you Hill. come up here? I'm gonna let him. Uh, come, yeah, come on up here. And Brian, talk quickly about the dis delay and disruption of one versus the other. I mean, the low pressure line we got coming up 58 is three different lines. So three if different lines. one were to go down, we still got we're two still okay. 20 inches to that's right. that's just right. divert it that way and still fix what we want, right? That's right. So that's, that's right. a real low likelihood. That, yeah, that's a real low likelihood. Exactly. Do you want right, to well, you can you describe that? So, um, <coughs> to answer your question about the the new versus rehabbed pipe, um, mm -hmm. what Brian was saying is that the the lining method that we're evaluating now. Uh, the pipe that goes in is a fully structural pipe, so you consider you could consider it a new pipe. Mm. So really, the life cycle of the line method would be comparable to open cut trench of a brand new pipe. Mm. Yeah. And do you know all the thickness? How thick is that line? I, I don't know. We, that we can get that you, for you, but it's it's brain. it's it's a lot. It's a lot. If you've seen it, applica the application, you know, they, they come <coughs> in sections that pipe actually gets fused together and then it becomes one content you can't tell where one where seamless with the seamless mm -hmm. and so you you end up potentially with with runs of uh, of a couple of thousand feet that you can pull and install at one time which is which is another so it's a shortens the amount of time to do the work um, and again it's less invasive is less um, uh, having you know um, do an excavation and so forth the challenge is where do you run 2,000 feet of pipe above ground to work before you can uh, uh, pull it through? And think about downtown Suffolk, and that's where we have our oldest lines. And it would be like uh, Offutt coming over here and saying, we want to cut up your streets. Mm -hmm. Suffolk's not going to stand for that. And so this is the best way to address those right. urban lines is to line those pipes. Now, there will be some disruption, but this also eliminates the the joints between <coughs> sections of pipe. Yeah, so fewer joints, fewer things to go wrong. And so you can line any diameter pipe, 30, 20, um, or is there? I mean, there? There are limitations when you get to a certain size, but um, the pipes we're looking at, are it's very feasible. Yeah, but if you line inside a pipe that's already there and we got a capacity of, say, oh. 15 million gallons going through, the liner now is going to take some of that out. So. Your 15 turns into 13, and and we're losing two. Now that's that's a very good question, and yes, you're correct. We will there will lose a little bit of capacity, but the modeling mm -hmm. um, work that we performed showed that uh, that we can still meet the the demand requirements. And see, if you have a leak, it might be leaking out of joint, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so yeah, you lose capacity on the inside diameter of the pipe, but you lose the the leak that might be leaking into the ground. Yeah, a, lot, a lot of the leaks that we have on those old pipes tend to be joint leaks. So do you, have you ever calculated the loss? If you're in Suffolk and you're pumping yeah, we know 15 million and you get out here to Churchland and you only get right. 10 million, do you ask where the other five or you just don't say anything? We do. Just no, keep no, going. No, we do that every day. <laughs> Remember okay. my analogy. If you do 100 <laughs> bottles and you're in the beverage business, you want 100 bottles on the, on store the back shelf. Yeah, that's right. Because you, you can't make money that way. Mm -hmm. And so we monitor how much we produce and how much we sell. And we're pretty efficient for our old system. It's less than 10% leakage. Well, that's good, though. That's telling you your joints aren't leaking. So why are you going to go and reline them? <laughs> All right, we'll leave the pipes like they are. <laughs> no, I'm just making a point. I mean, if you, if you're starting with 15 gallons on one end and you got 15 on the other end, you know. Remember the night that the guy hit the pipe and how, how scary it was for us? I mean, it scared us. May may not have scared you. Yeah. But, you know, we're putting back on alert. You yeah. know, watch it. Okay. Um, so the projects, these so the future projects that have been identified, we're going to um, we're going to do an interconnect between our low and high pressure systems out in Suffolk, 
which, which will provide better redundancy. So if we have issues, we can push water from one side to the other, like we talked about. So that's some, one of our challenges. Um, converting a portion of one of our low pressure mains to high pressure so we can, we can accomplish that pressure reducing valves to switch from one side to the other. Um, we're going to install a new uh, line in the uh, I-664 corridor to connect the, um, if I go back, oops. Oh, that's a good sign. So we're going to do an interconnect here to, to help, again, being able to move water from one side to the next. Um, we're going to line, we already talked about the structural independent uh, lining system um, that we're going to put in on the low pressure side, again, reducing the now, as you look at this map, think about the things that lie here. First, you've got to get permission from BDOT. Second, you've got to get all the environmental permits. First, uh, another is that you have to have conversations with, with Chesapeake and Suffolk about this. So this is not a project that's going to take place at the snap of a finger. It's going to be a project that's going to be spread over 10 or 15 years. What about the railroad companies? You've got to oh, get yeah. You well, gotta, yeah. yeah. So, so these are our next steps that Mr. Rose alluding to. Um, the first couple of projects is the I-664 uh, corridor and then improvements in downtown Suffolk, including that interconnection. That will be what we work on first. It's a multi, multi-year project. You'll start seeing it in our future uh, capital program moving forward. Um, but it, again, it's not something that's going to happen all at once. And we've got the, you know, now's the time we're trying to be proactive, make sure you know, this has lasted us for over a century, and we're, we're looking you know, out the next century, making sure we take care of our, our infrastructure so it can continue to serve us. Let me give you an analogy. You, you know, we've got 16 filters at the water treatment plant. We're redoing them. We're taking them from 16 to 8. 8. 30 million dollars, right? Yeah, right. Is that what we're spending? That. Yeah, okay. right. But that, that is a project that the genesis goes back uh, more than a decade and a half. Uh, we're now into uh, probably we got four more years left, five more years left before we do all the. Well, we're going to go to well, well. We're getting we're getting health department approval now. Then we'll go to bid, and then you're looking at a three-year construction yeah. time frame. So, I mean, these things take a long time to get birth and then mature. But we got to start planning now financially as Carol starts looking at the capital needs for the uh, for the utility system. We got to crank in, you know, what when do we need to issue that and how much? Right. Okay. And this is all covered under our fund, but we need to make right. sure that we don't exactly. deplete that fund. We right. break this thing up in such a way that it's done. In I mean, and, and here's the tieback. Remember, we say that this is enterprise fund and the revenues are sufficient to cover uh, all the cost, O&M plus that service. We've been issuing what is, in effect, GO bonds. And remember, GO bonds, general obligation bonds, there's a cap on what you can issue. It's the Constitution sets that statutory cap. Revenue bonds, there are no caps. And so in the vernacular, these were double-barrel revenue bonds. They were general obligation bonds that count against our debt, but we use the revenue from the system in order to retire the debt. Now with the pension bond, we now have to look at the possibility of issuing pure revenue debt, uh, revenue bonds, and the risk is higher because you got to convince the bond buyer that you, you've got a sufficient amount of revenue there that comes in that you're not going to default on the bonds. And so it ties back together. That's why we are, we're concerned about you know, our debt service on the general fund and how much money we can uh, use of that. Because the rating agency is also exactly. going to be looking at this right. going, right. okay, because part of our pitch when we're in New York is we talk about how, yes. how, how, how well our utility fund is and all of that. If we lose and, that and as part of our presentation, then... Exactly. And when we go to a revenue bond, uh, if that's the direction we go in, we'll be looked almost, in some ways, on standalone, much more, they'll be much more critical looking at just what you're talking about, our, our revenue, and making sure we're doing all the things that we need to be doing. So what's the sweet spot about... From, from a, a dollar perspective that we can take out of that that won't give us those impacts? Is it $2 million, $3 million, $5 million a year, $10 million? 
I'm sorry. But I'm Do we know how the fund balance? Yeah. No, no, no. Out of the utility fund That's to be able to do that. So if this whole thing is going to cost us a billion dollars over the next 20 years. We don't know yet. Yeah. We, okay. We don't, we How much of that do we want to swallow up yeah. front? We, we don't Because know. we don't want to choke ourselves and hurt ourselves for our credit exactly. rating agencies. And, okay. and, and we have the same. We have our own policy on how much reserves to keep in the utility fund that you all adopted with the help of the uh, um, our financial advisors. We're above that. So we want to make sure we keep we're in line with what the rating agencies recommend, but also um, if we're above that limit, that gives us some money that we can cash fund and not have to borrow as much, which keeps our debt service payments down. So we really look at all of those factors and make sure we're doing all we can to manage and make sure we are as efficient as possible in, in, uh, in how we're spending. Okay. Thanks for your question. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Wait, Vice I just want to throw this one thing out. It has nothing to do with water, but it's a mountain. Okay. I don't know what cloud is over is that the power keeps going off all over the city the last 10 days. <laughs> uh, I mean, I know it's been cold, but it's crazy. I mean, it's been off and on all over the city for six, eight, ten days. Maybe somebody from Dominion might okay. share something well, with us tomorrow night. Let us let us try to get that. We had a couple of minutes downtown at several intervals, yeah. but in some other areas West it was Haven, off for uh, 30 and 40 minutes. Churchland. Right before Christmas, downtown went out. Dennis, uh, the Dennis. I think this weekend we had a, a, a downtown. I, my yeah. house went out last night for oh, only okay. a few minutes, but but I'm watching on Facebook. Everybody's yeah. talking about well, all I, over the uh, city. Uh, all dog the trail went out for about two hours, uh, but yeah. we'll, we'll try to find the answer. It just seems strange. So I, just, I, just, I know we're getting at the end. I just wanted to say thank you to uh, my staff and folks for all of them. We did a lot of work on both of these with our consultant. But I forgot to introduce Susan Watson at the beginning. Oh, yeah. Susan is our treatment plant manager hey. at Lake Kilby. Um, she's been the plant manager for, you. for almost uh, 10 years, and she's a 22-year city employee. Oh. And she and her folks do an excellent job. You were in the paper as she's well when they did the featured article, right? Weren't you? Sure. That's right. And she's a girl. That's right. <laughs> All of you maybe have met Susan. I know without being in Suffolk, you don't interact as much with them, but I wanted to just recognize her so you could put a uh, name with her face. Okay. Thank you. Thank How you. you doing? Very good. Thank you, Susan. I know this has been long for coming up in three hours, mm -hmm. and but this is the tenth work that you've done tonight, and uh, thank you for your okay. questions and your attention. Right, anything else for the good of the board? All right, we're adjourned. Mm -hmm. uh -oh.